In this segment, we will meet the candidates for the House of Delegates 96th district seat. This is the uh, seat currently held by Majority Leader Eric Householder, who will not be returning to that seat. And the candidates are uh, Nikki Lower and Lisa White. Thank you both for coming. We appreciate your time. Thank Nikki you. is the Democrat. Lisa is the Republican. You'll both get a minute for an opening statement or so, not strict on that. Uh, and then we'll reverse the order for the closing statement. Uh, as well. In between, you'll get questions from Bill Stubblefield. He is a retired admiral, former Berkeley County Commission president, and uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, who I suppose I should say is also a retired safety engineer. Yes. So if there's any problems you have with the seating arrangements up there, <laughs> see him about that. He knows how to engineer the seats. fall off or trip. I need yes. To... I had nothing to do with the arrangement of courts. <laughs> that's, that's not me. <laughs> He's setting us for nine <laughs> violations already, I believe. Uh, if uh, once they ask you questions, you have a minute or two to answer those questions. And uh, during the course of any of your responses, if you invoke your opponent's name or any policies that they, uh, they have uh, cited, you are entitled to respond directly uh, to that uh, point of reference. Just <clears throat> raise your hand or whatever to let me know you'd like to go and respond in that, and we'll take care of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, for the uh, opening statements, we will start first with Nikki Lower, the Democrat. Nikki? Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Anika Nikki Lauer. I'm running for District 96 House of Delegates. I am running for office because I don't think people should be keeping warm by an oven. I don't think that anyone should have to ration insulin to make it last longer. I don't think that West Virginia should be choosing between which family member gets medication because they can't afford both because we can't be bothered to pay a livable wage while charging extremely high rates for life-saving medication. These are just some of the things that I or my mother went through before she had passed away from overwork, working two jobs from my entire childhood. I'm running for office because I would like to do my part in giving the working class and seniors on a fixed income a better life. Lisa White. Hi, good morning. Thank you um, for having us again. I appreciate this opportunity. I am Lisa White, and I'm running for District 96. I'm married. I have uh, two children and two grandsons and maybe one on the way my daughter's um in the process of adopting they uh all moved here we all moved well i moved here in 2019 and my children followed a year later my husband and i moved here because we were attracted to the conservative values of west virginia and its beauty i retired from a jesuit retreat house as the marketing and development director my husband is a union electrician and works in loudon county so West Virginia was very appealing to us, again, for their conservative values. We moved here. We got quickly involved in local politics. We uh, joined the Berkeley County Republican Club, got involved with that, was their treasurer for two years, met Eric Householder, and he decided to vacate his seat by running for state auditor. So I met with him, had coffee, and decided to run myself. I've been doing a lot of door knocking and meeting people, and I've shake, shaken their hands, and met eye contact with them and vowed to them that I will uphold and continue to back and, and be a, a voice for them as a great steward for them in, their, in our district to conserve our conservative values here in West Virginia. Thank you again for having us. Appreciate you both being here. And we'll start first with Bill Stubblefield in the first question. Good morning, ladies, and thanks for joining us. Uh, it has been argued by some that many of our infrastructure needs have been met and that we should begin to emphasize more social issues. Do you agree with this position? I'll start with you, Ms. White. Uh, as far as the infrastructure, I believe that that is a county commission um, position, that they, that's, what they are, that's what they're responsible for. Our social issues, I'm not sure what specifically you're, you're talking about. What social issues? Well, uh, this last time there's uh, uh, transgender labeling, the content of school library books, the requirements of school children to view certain films regarding abortion and the like. That's uh, some of the social issues that were introduced uh, in last leg uh, the legislation. Are you talking about that, the, the um, film that Patricia Rucker put forth? About the abortion? I've, I've actually forgotten who put it forward. But it's I, called Baby Something. Okay, yeah, I think it probably it was. Probably something. was, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure about, I mean, I know that um, some of the books that I have seen that are in the public libraries, I don't know if you've seen them, but I think some of them need to be behind the counter. Um, but as far as transition issues in our schools, I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, as transgender. Gender issues. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. I'm not quite sure 
exactly what your point is and what you're trying to get at. But as far as elementary school children, I don't think that that needs to be something we need to be discussing for elementary school children. I think we need to get back to the basic education. I don't discriminate against anybody, and I don't think any of my colleagues do, and I don't, I'm not a proponent yeah. for that at all. Um, I do think that we need to be honest about our pro-life issues and our abortion issues um, as far as it, you know, woman's choice and all of that. I think we need to be have honest conversations about that. I'm not sure it belongs in elementary school or middle school. I know that my grandson goes to high school here, and a lot of the issues that are being discussed in high school, it's very confusing for the kids. It's putting a lot of burden on them. It's causing a lot of depression. It's causing a lot of issues. As he puts it very eloquently, it's an adult experiment that he thinks is going to go really wrong because kids are are really in, in depression mode. They're try it's hard enough going through puberty. I don't know if you guys remember going through puberty, but it's hard enough going through <laughs> puberty that I've got to now, I've got to figure out what I identify with and what I not. True story, I wanted to be a boy growing up. And my mother said, if I could kiss my elbow, I could do that. I would try every night. I, I almost <laughs> broke my arm trying to do it. But I, you know, I, I grew out of that. I think some kids do, some kids don't. But I grew out of that, and I realized that I am attracted to men, but I do like boy things. I think we pigeonhole people too much in this society. We put them in boxes, and I just think we need to get out of some of that stuff, the labeling. I think everybody deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. I don't know if I answered your question or Actually, not. Actually, you did, yes. Remember. Ms. Lohr? Hi. Yes, I do believe that while that is a very wide range of issues, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> While I do support a woman's right to choose, I believe that we also spend way too much time on bills where we could be concentrating on fixing the poverty crisis, fixing childcare, fixing foster care. And I feel like at this point, we can be talking about social issues, but that doesn't mean we also can't talk about infrastructure. It's just we need to, as an assembly and a legislative body, decide where our priorities lie. And I feel like you can choose both. And I don't think that should be a problem. John Gilstrap. Um, my first question goes to Nikki. Um, first of all, is it Lauer or Lower? Lauer. Lauer, okay. Um, reading through your website, a lot of your platform seems to be consumed with something near and dear to my heart, which is firefighting and EMS. Uh, what are the needs that we're facing now, and what do you want to see done to address them? So I would like to see, I know West Virginia is short on ambulances and fire trucks. I would like to see resources be diverted to that as well as requiring insurance companies to cover mental health and establishing a somewhat of a system that allows them to find the specific type of mental health they need and places and hook them mental up. Mental health for firefighters? Yes, and EMTs, public servants. Um, I believe that that is increasingly important as we are really diverting as much attention to that as we should be. We're constantly bringing up bills in the legislature that get shelved to support them, and I feel like it's important that we start doing that again. Any idea what the magnitude of that would be in terms of dollars? I'm not completely you sure. You said something to... about 200 tankers short. Yeah. I think a tanker runs something like $750,000. I'm not asking every tanker be replaced. I'm just wanting to start working our way towards that. And Lisa, is that something that's the responsibility of the state government? Well, I know that they give um, $6 million to that a year. They, they did put in an extra $6 million this past year. That's going to be distributed um, by population. I know that Berkeley County, we have the only paid firefighters here. I know that the municipalities have them throughout the state, but Berkeley County is the only one that has a paid firefighter. So I know that they are giving money. They are doing training. I think they're doing the best that they can with the money that they have. So. Um, they, they did give another additional $6 million, like I said, for some of that, and, um, and that's going to be distributed through by population in the state. Bill, if I recall, you were involved in the negotiations to bring paid Actually, yes, so. I was. I was one that kind of pushed that. And there was a partnership between the volunteers and the county. I would like to see other counties emulate mm -hmm. this. That kind of goes back to the basic question. Uh, how much of responsibility of EMS – falls upon the uh, the state as opposed to falling upon the counties themselves. And the um, individual fire departments. And the individual fire departments, mm -hmm. exactly right, yeah. So there's actually three, three components. How should the balance be between those three as far as providing services? 
Ms. White? Well, I know that in Berkeley County, so we have the bill that we get sent out with our personal property taxes that we need to pay firefighters and we need to pay that. I think that was also one of the other stipulations in some of the legislation when they were giving out money that, um, that they wanted the other state um, firefighters and EMS to do that as well and when they did that and they showed that they were making an effort to put in money then that the state legislators were going to make an effort to, to help them in those particular counties that were Im implementing that so I think that that's where we need to be and that's where the government needs to be looking at that if they're working on getting money and, and raising money there then that, that, I think that's another uh, one of the, the things that they were not just population but that was another resource that they were looking at before they gave out extra money. That was one of the requirements. It was, exactly right. Ms. Lauer? Can you repeat the question? The, the, uh, where does responsibility lie in providing fire and emergency service? Uh, in a lot of the counties, uh, it's between the, the volunteers themselves and the, uh, and the state. The county does not assume much responsibility. The question is, should we migrate more toward financial support from the counties as opposed to relying mostly on the state and the volunteers? I do believe that we need to start moving it towards the counties. Um, I believe that we should also be supporting it at the state also. I think that's, I feel like that responsibility should rely a lot on both because we can't do it alone and trying to raise taxes trying to raise these things through taxpayers does become a burden after a certain point. And I feel like that's just something that should have to be discussed. But I also believe that also folks should have a say in that. So that should be something that the voters are able to have a say in as well. New question, Bill, or yeah. move on? No, let's go. The question that we ask frequently, uh, will you support home rule for counties? And we tend to think of home rule only as the, the increase in a 1% sales tax, but it's broader than that. Would you support home rule for counties? Yeah, and the 1% sales tax would not be mandatory. It's an optional thing. That's right, and it could be implemented by referendum or yes. whatever. Okay. Who you asking? Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Lauer first. Yeah, so while I see the benefits of home rule in other places, um, I'm okay with it. However, I do believe that we need to, that it should also be a, that should also be up to the voters, in my opinion, that should be a ballot initiative. Mm -hmm. But I also do not support, if we are just wanting a home rule for specifically the 1% extra tax, I don't want to be putting that, that burden on taxpayers. Ms. White? Well, home rule, as far as I, what I understand it to be, is also pushing back where they can change some things uh, constitutionally, uh, the West Virginia Constitution, if it brought, is brought back to the, uh, the counties. As far as that goes, I don't agree with that. I do think it needs to be on the ballot. It needs to be a voter thing. I don't think that we need to willy-nilly give out the, the um, power to every county in the state to be able to change if they decide to change some of the constitutions, the state constitution, the, the constitution of the United States, I mean, I, I just think that needs to come back and that needs to be voted on. So I think we need to have structure around that. I don't think it can just be something that we just throw out there. Mr. Gilstrap. We've talked a lot here this morning, and we're going to do it again here, about the educational system here in uh, West Virginia. Uh, the, the summation of it is it's not very good. Um, we are in the upper third in terms of per capita spending on children, uh, on students, and we, we fight with Mississippi for last place in terms of performance. So w what do you see as the solution on how do we fix this? Who are you going to first? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go to Ms. Lauer first. Me? Yes. So I think the first step in addressing the problem with us being last in education is addressing the poverty crisis. I think that we as a state don't put enough emphasis on the idea that we have one of the highest rates of children living with their grandparents. We have a foster care crisis going on in the state right now. We also need to fix child care. I think that a lot of kids, whenever they come home after school, they don't have enough time to study. You want to talk about standardized tests and poor testing scores, but we don't talk about the kind of things those kids go at, through at home. We need to be talking about 
how to how to implement as well as how to fix living wage, how to fix childcare, how to fix the foster care system. I think because we have a lot of kids that come home, they take care of their siblings. We have folks in childcare who are taking out $20,000 loans to pay their payroll, and that's unacceptable. And these kids are going home, they have to watch their siblings because their can't, parents can't really afford childcare. And that in turn affects the education system as it stands. So that's the identification of the problem. So if you're elected, you'll be responsible for coming up as part of the solution. So spitball a solution for us. What, what, what would be a, how would you go about solving that problem or an idea to solve that problem? Paying parents a livable wage, ensuring that they can afford child care, coming up with child care subsidies, allowing child care workers to have their children in their programs where they can't afford to have their kids in the programs. I think that that in turn would help West Virginia as a whole, not only with the poverty crisis and fixing the education system, but in general, fi helping the economy as well. Is right? Well, I mean, I am uh, for um, full and total school choice. I mean, that's one of the things I have on my platform. And, and you know, the, the big lie that's being told is that takes away from the public system. It does not. It's, it's based on enrollment, and that's where the budget is made, is based on enrollment, and that's done in October. So it's not taking away from the public school system. I do believe that free market works. And I, you know, I agree that we, you know, a livable wage and, and, and we need childcare and we need this, but it's like, where are we going to get the money to do all of that stuff? I mean, we're throwing tons of money at our education system and it's not working. We're still 49th in the state. So I think we do need to take a step back. We do need to do some research and some studies. My um, campaign manager and I were talking about this on Sunday. I don't see where there's a, a problem where we don't collaborate with our governor, who I think is going to be Patrick Morrissey, and, and you know, really try to maybe meet with some of the other states that are ranking in the top 10 and see what they're doing in their state. How are they, how are they combating this issue and how are they ranking so high in the state? So I think that's one thing that we need to do. But, you know, the main problem is inflation right now is off the charts, and that's not going to stop if we have the same administration on the federal level coming back in again in 2025. So you're going to have to find and we're going to have to navigate as legislators ways. How are we going to navigate around inflation going up and up if that's the case, if that's what happens, in order to provide for the most vulnerable, to help out for these, these um, issues that we have with child care? Where are we going to get the money? I think, you know, I've talked about this before. It's a cultural issue where in our minds we just say government, 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 but it's our money. It's not the government's money, and it doesn't grow on trees. So I think that we, we need to be responsible. We need to take a step back. We need to do some really heavy look at our, our, our public school systems and find out where the, where the deficiencies are in that before we start throwing more money at that. And, again, Inflation is, is an issue here. And when I go door knocking, that's an issue for the people that I knock on their doors. So, you know, if it just keeps going up and up, I, the legislators are going to have a very tricky job in navigating that and also helping out our most vulnerable, which I think we do need to help out our most vulnerable, but it's going to be a tricky balancing act. But you're not going to be in a position to fix inflation. No. So you're going to have, to play, you're going to, have to play the hand But it does dogs. affect, yeah, we're going to have to put, yeah, but it does affect our local state um, issues. So, I mean, no, I'm not responsible for that. I'm not responsible for the federal level except for my vote. Right. When, okay. So I'm going to go and vote, and I hope everybody does. But, um, but, but we are given a hand with that. I mean, inflation has affected everybody in the state of West Virginia when they go to the grocery store, when they go to put gas in their tanks. So it is affecting that. I do believe in locality pay. I believe in that, too. And I do think that we need special programs. And I, I think Nikki's right in the one regard where we need to take a look at our most vulnerable, our children, and see where they are and the poverty level that they're in. What I'm saying is it's going to be a hard navigation to work around that and try to lower taxes to give more money back to our people when inflation is going up. It's just it's going to be a challenge, a, a challenge that I'm willing to take on, but it's still going to be a challenge. 
Bill? Yeah. What role should our legislators play in protecting of our natural resources? And I'm thinking specifically of our groundwater, which was put under great stress this past year. And if data centers come in, it will be put in even more of a stress. What role should our legislators play? And I'll start with you first, Ms. Lauer. Yeah, I would like to see the folks that are doing the construction of these buildings be held accountable. I would also like to see us create a system where we can link the local government as well as the county commission to experts before we go and do these kinds of large projects. I think that whenever we bring businesses in, we need to evaluate whether they're going to be harmful to our environment. And I think that's just things that we are going to have to start going through before we allow businesses to come into the state. Ms. White. Well, I do think it is a county commission. Um, no, no, I'm thinking about statewide, not just individual on the county commission role. Berkeley County is taking some aggressive role, but as a state, what should the legislators do, if anything, to protect our groundwater? A lot of states are, have been taking action on this. West Virginia has been in the privileged position. They have not had to, but if this year is an indicator, they may have to in the future. Well, I, I'm not going to say I'm an expert on that. I'm not. But I, if it is an issue and it is a problem, I'm more than willing to be uh, right in there with everybody else trying to figure out how to do that. I agree. I think if we are bringing people in and it is going to cause problems with our groundwater, then we need to be more stewards of that, too. We need to be taking a look at that before we just pull the trigger and say, come on in here. You know, we need to, we need to be more responsible with that. I do agree with that. Okay. Mr. Gilstrap. Um, actually, there's a question for both of you. I have an idea how it's going to go, but I'll throw it out anyway. Mm -hmm. are, are you supportive of the form energy model of bringing uh, companies into the state where the state puts out great um, incentive packages to a company that then comes? And as, as a proponent of small businesses, I would say provides a lot of opportunity for small businesses to, to support the, the employees of the large company. Um, are you a proponent of that model or not? And I will start with, with uh, Lisa. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So as far as form energy goes, um, I'm not not – I well, I am opposed because of the optics of it, because of the green energy and because of Bill Gates. But I will say that I have gone out – and, you know, my mind shifted a little bit on this because of talking to my constituents. I've gone out to small businesses and I've talked to them. There's another company that we just – um, had come in. It's a uniform company. And, you know, they get tax breaks. I mean, Kentucky does it. Virginia does it. So we're in competition with the other states doing that. So I talked to a couple of small business owners in, in my district, and I was surprised at the answer. And they kind of changed my mind on this. I said, you know, how do you feel about that? They're getting all this special treatment, and here you are, small business owners, still paying inventory tax, still paying taxes, still this, still that. How do you feel about that? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I, I, I'm, I'm okay with it because if they bring these companies in here and they're working, they're making money, and their money is going to be spent at my company. So why wouldn't I like that idea? That kind of changed me a little bit. It kind of opened my mind to it a little bit. And, and so, I, you know, as far as that goes, I mean, you know, when we're doing that, I also think on the flip side of that because I am a small – uh, business person, I do think that we need to put that back on the ballot to get rid of the inventory tax. Berkeley County was the only one that voted to do it. We need to get it back on there. We need to streamline permits for small businesses. We can't overlook the small businesses just because we're bringing big business in, but the small business owners don't mind the big businesses coming in because they're going to provide jobs and they're, they're going to make money and, those, you know, in turn, they're going to spend money at their businesses. So that I... I am a very conservative Republican, and I did not go in thinking that those small business owners were going to say that to me. I thought they were going to say, oh, no, I, why can't I get that? You know, but that's not what their attitude was. And like I said, I am representing my constituents in Charleston, so I am open-minded to listen to what they have to say. And when they said that to me, it really opened up my mind to that. Nikki? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, are you supportive of the form energy model of bringing businesses in where the, the state of West Virginia provided great economic incentives to the company to move in? So I don't, 
the history of businesses taking advantage of that from West Virginia is the fact that they're leaving once those incentives end. And that's a problem. Um, it's basically taking advantage of the system. In turn, like Lisa said, it's taking advantage of our small businesses who have been here for so long that are struggling, that have to pay, take out loans to pay their payroll. While we're giving tax breaks to businesses that come into the state, not to mention the idea that these businesses may be harmful to the economy or to the environment itself. And I don't think that we should, as a state, continue doing that to its extent, because we do need to start supporting our small businesses. I agree with Lisa, we do need to get rid of the inventory tax. It is so important to start moving on towards supporting our small businesses before we're reaching out to these large corporations to come into the state and ruin our environment. It's time to move on to... Can I just say one thing? So, you know, once you're there in this situation and you're seeing what all goes into these businesses too, I don't know what the clawback, I think that's what it's called, um, clause is and when they're doing these kind of deals with the, the companies, but I'd like to know what that is. So if they do leave after the incentives come up, are we getting some of that money back? And, and I don't know how they make that deal because I'm not there, so I didn't see it. I didn't sign the contract, so I would like to know that when we're making those deals. It's time to move on to closing statements now. We'll do this in inverse order of how we began. So, uh, Lisa White, you will go first. So thank you again for having us. Again, I'm Lisa White. If you want to find out more information about me, my website is Lisa, F-O-R-W-V-D-96. I'm also on Facebook, Lisa 4 wv and I have my, my uh, email address, my phone number, if you need to reach out and ask me questions. I am going to be doing forums before legislation, and I, I plan on doing those after to explain my vote and, and keep in contact with my constituents. I do believe that we – it's not a one and done. You don't just door knock before you get elected, that once you're elected that you keep in contact with your constituents. I have vowed to do that. Again, I shake their hand. I look them in the eye and I vow to be a good steward for them, to listen to them and to um, go down to Charleston and represent them. Um, and they know what I stand for, so if they're going to vote for me, they're going to vote for that kind of values. I, I want to make sure that West Virginia stays conservative. I love our conservative values. And thanks again for having us. Thank you. Nikki? My name is Nikki Lauer. I'm running for District 96. A little bit more about my platform. I'd like to introduce an amendment to the state constitution for the right to privacy, protect fire and EMS workers. I'd like to introduce affordable child care, paid family leave. Um, I oppose any increases to gas tax or food tax. And you can reach me on my Facebook. It has my email and my phone number. Um, again, thank you guys for having us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. And we wish you both the best of luck coming election day. Thank you. Thank you. We will be back with more in four minutes.